All right, welcome. Uh, this is Mr. H, Mr. Huminski. Let's look at some common mistakes in graphing. This is uh, kind of a approach to better understand graphing is if we can understand the mistakes and hopefully this better um, allows us to understand how to graph. So let's take a let's take a look at this graph. So we're given a data table here of water depth in feet, temperature in Celsius. That's our data table. We got two pieces of information. So now with this information, we gotta figure out a couple of things. Um, so one thing we should try to figure out is, you know, what kind of graph will we use? So what type of graph? Is it a bar? Is it a pie? Is it uh, a line graph? I don't know if you remember some of that. Um, change over time would be our line graph. Comparing groups or categories would be bar. And then looking at parts of a whole would be like a pie chart. All right, so once we figure out the type of graph we're gonna use, we gotta figure out, well, what goes on the x-axis and what goes on the y-axis? So we have two pieces of information, so we're gonna just have to figure out which goes on which. Um, so the x-axis is always, always, always our independent variable. And then that begs the question, well, what's independent variable? All right, so let's, let's delve into that and look at our example here of water depth and the temperature. All right, so that means the y-axis is gonna be our dependent variable. Again, you may say, well, what does that mean? So one way to kind of look at it is uh, independent means nothing's gonna affect it, and dependent, something's affecting it. In this case, the independent variable, we're seeing if it affects the dependent variable. Or if you'd rather use the word dependent, you can totally do that. We can rephrase this instead of saying independent affects dependent, you can say something like the dependent depends on the independent. All right, so if we look on this, then what affects what? Does the water depth affect the temperature or does the temperature affect the water depth? Well, you know, pause it if you wanna think about it for a second. And hopefully you realize that the water depth, it is what it is, right? Nothing's really affecting it, but it's going to affect the temperature. The temperature kind of, it depends on what water depth you're in, how deep in the water you are. So that means our independent variable would be our water depth, because again, it's affecting something else, and our dependent would be the temperature. So we gotta put the water depth as our x-axis, and you see it's there, and then our temperature as our y-axis. All right, the next thing we have to do is figure out the scale for the y-axis. So we gotta kind of set up, label the y-axis, label the x-axis. So what's the scale gonna be? The scale is kind of like, what is each box worth? In this case, the student wrote, hey, I'm gonna use a scale of 10. Each of these boxes goes by tens. So that's their scale. They're going by tens. And you want it to be consistent. You go by 10, every single box needs to go by 10. And they're doing that. Now the problem with this scale is we can't really go by 10 because if we do that, look at our data, it's all kind of crunched there at the bottom. So we got here, we have 10 degrees, eight degrees, five degrees, four, two. Um, we notice it's five, because it's kind of like sound effects here, about halfway between zero and 10. Eight is almost 10, but not quite. That's not exact, too, it's kind of right above zero. So, but look, all of our data is just crunched here. Look at this, all the rest of this graph. We didn't even use it. This is a problem. We're not going to be able to see really good trends here. We can see the data is kind of going down, but it's hard to see. So, that's a problem of scale. We have to get a better scale. So, what should we do? Let's pick a different scale. We shouldn't go by tens. Well, what scale should we go by? Well, here's our data for the y-axis. We go from two to 10. So our largest number is 10. If you count the number of lines we have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 10 lines. So we gotta fit it within 10 lines. Well, our biggest number is 10. We only have 10 lines. So I can kind of just do 10 divided by 10. Then we get one. So my scale, one would work. So instead of going by tens, I should probably go by ones. Now, if you wanted to go by twos, you'd probably go by twos, but much beyond that, again, your data will be kind of crunched. It'll all be sort of at the bottom or something like that. 
Um, and if we can prevent that, we want to prevent it. So here's what it would look like. Let me go ahead and clear this screen here. Actually, let me keep the stuff on the left. So we figure out this is not a good scale. It's too big because all our data is here at the bottom, all crunched and kind of don't like that. So we're looking at trends. So here's an example of a better scale where the student did go by one. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And they used a, a line graph. Why did show do a line graph? Um, so you have to ask yourself, well, what are we doing here? We're showing sort of change in water depth. It's not really change over time, um, but we are showing sort of change as, as we change the depth. Sorry, the line's a little messed up, but that's okay. So we got our, our y-axis, a better scale where all the data fits. We didn't run out of room, which is good. You know, if we went by 0.5, we'd run out of room, but we didn't. And then we have our x-axis is kind of labeled here and it kind of goes by five, five, and it's not written here, but this, this right here would be like 10, and then 15, and 20, 25, 30, and then 35. Oh, we have an extra 35 here. This should be 45, but we haven't got that far, so you haven't have to label that. Now, again, they didn't label this part, but that's okay. We kind of assume we know what it is. It's five, because that's a consistent scale. We label the x-axis. We label the y-axis. We should probably put what it is in, because temperature can be in Celsius, it can be in Fahrenheit, so we should probably do that. So I'm gonna write in Celsius. A little sloppy, but whatever. And water depth, again, is it meters? Is it centimeters? Is it nautical miles? That's from like a SpongeBob song, right? Uh, it's feet, so we gotta label that. All right, this graph looks much better than our last graph, because our last graph, again, the scale is way too big, and all of our data is crunched here. Our biggest number only goes to 10, and you can see here it kind of ends here. Not a good scale to use. All right, let's look at another example and see if you guys follow along. We'll look at sort of what's wrong. All right, so here's a new data table. We have type of tree and the number of fruit on each of those trees. So you want to ask yourself, you know, maybe in my garden, do I plant an apple tree, an orange tree, lemon tree, or cherry tree? You know, I want to get the most fruit out of it. Well, which tree typically produces the most amount of fruit or something like that? And so they have numbers here. All right, cool. So we have two different things. We got to figure out what's the type of graph. Well, hmm, are we showing change over time? Are we showing comparison of groups or categories? Or are we showing a sort of part of a whole? And so tell us what type of graph. And I'll let you kind of pause there to think about it. What type of graph would you use? And then the next one is what would be the y and x axis? So our, our y axis is our dependent and our x axis is independent. Well, what's affecting what? Is the type of tree affecting how much fruit? Or is it how much fruit affecting what type of tree it is? Uh, this one's a little tougher, I guess, because it's kind of weird to say it that way. But the tree is a tree, right? So what's really um, dependent on it? Well, the different types of trees have different numbers of fruit on it, according to this data. So in this case, our type of tree is going to be our independent variable. And what depends on the fruit type of tree is the number of fruit. And the number of fruit, another way to kind of look at it is what are we measuring? We're not sure what, how much fruit is on each tree. We know what type of tree it is, but we're not sure how much fruit is on it. So the dependent is usually what we're measuring. We're not really sure of it. We're going to measure it because it's being affected by something else. That's what they did here. We put type of tree. We put number of fruit. So uh, it's labeled correctly X and Y. All right, now ask yourself, what's wrong with this scale? So again, we go from 50. It's our lowest number. 88 is our highest. So I'll let you think about that. If you want to pause the video, think. What's wrong with our scale here? Well, everything fits here, but is it consistent? Let's see, this goes by three. So that means this box, sorry, this to here is three. And then all of a sudden now this box here to here is four. Let me go back to three. Then we go to two. So you can see our scale is not consistent. This is not a good scale because it's not consistent. It's kind of jumping around. And sort of one box here to here is worth three, but this same box here is now worth four, 
and it goes back to being three. And then this box from here to here is worth two. And then this is worth three. This is worth two. This is worth three. This is worth from here to here is worth five here to here. So all of a sudden, you know, each box is not sort of consistent. It's not regular. It's our data will look weird because you don't have a regular pattern. So that's one thing wrong with our y-axis scale. What's another thing that's wrong with our y-axis scale? All right, well, usually with the y-axis, again, you can pause it if you want to think about it, but usually y-axis, what do we start at? We usually start at zero. So that's kind of a rule of thumb. You don't always, always, always have to, but for the most part, for sort of uh, your high school career, it's usually good to start on the y-axis, so a few exceptions to that. All right, so if we're gonna start at zero for the y-axis, what should my scale be? Well, our biggest number is 88. Again, I have, it's the same graph setup. So there's 10 boxes if you count them. Well, 88 divided by 10, oop, that's a bad 10, but it's supposed to be a 10, um, is you can use a calculator if you want, but it's 8.8. .8. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't wanna make a scale where it's like, zero, 8.8, .8, and then whatever 8.8 .8 times two is, and whatever 8.8 .8 times three is, like I wouldn't want to do that. So instead of 8.8, .8, maybe I want to do nine. Or if you still, you're like, I don't remember my multiplication tables of nine, so it'll be a little messy. We can go by 10, right? We're still kind of be able to fit it, and we'll have a consistent scale. All the data will fit. It won't be too crunched or too spread out, and that should work. So let's look at what that would look like. Let me just erase that. Figure out independent, we figure out dependent, figure out what type of graph. Oh, did we figure out what type of graph? What type of graph should we use? If we're comparing the different types of trees, how much fruit they pr produce, what type of graph would you use? All right, let's look at uh, a good example of this. Actually, let me look at one bad example, or not so good example. So this person actually has a good scale. So they go by tens, so that's good. And it's consistent, you keep going by tens, that works. They have apple, orange, lemon, and cherry labeled. They have the data here, this one's 50, maybe move up the dot a little bit, but that's fine. This one's 62, right above 60, back down 57, on up to 88, just before 90. Yeah, so the data works, but, we're using a line graph. A line graph typically is showing sort of change over time. We're not really showing change over time here. We're comparing different types of trees. So again, I ask you what type of graph should we use? If it ain't a line graph, we're left with either pie or bar chart or bar graph. And let's go with the bar graph. So here's a very colorful version of it. We even got a little key here, which is nice. Student provided a key here of the colors, what they each bar means. Uh, again, we have a consistent scale here. There's no title, but we can just put a title there. Uh, number of fruit by tree, um, type of tree and fruit, type of tree versus fruit, um, something like that. You usually just put the X and Y axis labels and kind of put them together with some sort of uh, in-between word like by, by or verse or even and. All right, so this is kind of, this is a good graph because we use the appropriate type of graph. We have the independent variable, dependent variable. We have a consistent scale, scale that fits all of our data. Then the bars are not too crunched or too sort of stretched out. So our kind of scale works that way. Um, and then we got, you know, label and title and stuff like that. So I should put that as another step, label, title, you got to plot your data too. And this person plotted the data, I think correctly, definitely. All right, and you plot the data. Step five. All right, let's look at another example. And again, let's figure out what's wrong with it and how we can fix it. Um, plot the data. And this is all examples from the graph in exit ticket on scaling, where you had to practice making these scales. Plot the data or data. Uh, which one do you prefer, data or data? I use them both kind of. Um, the data means again, we're plotting this. Uh, in this case, it's bars. Sometimes there'll be dots or data points for a line graph. 
All right. One more, two more examples. One more example, two more. All right, so number of burgers eaten this year, and then you have these five children. That's our two pieces of information. You got to figure out, well, what type of graph we're using. Uh, we got different kids and how much burgers they eat for the whole year. So we're kind of comparing five different kids and how much burgers they ate. Um, I feel like not all burgers are the same, but that's cool. We got to figure out what's the independent, what's the dependent, what affects what? Is a child affecting how much burgers are being eaten? Or is the number of burgers affecting who the child is? Or if you rather look at it, is the, does the child depend on how many burgers we're eating? Or does the number of burgers eaten depend upon which child it was? Hopefully you realize the child is the independent variable. It's not really being affected by anything. And the number of burgers depends upon which kid it is. Um, so that'd be our dependent variable. So you got here on the y-axis. Let's look at our scale. The student here, again, so like this first box is worth five. Cool. The next box is worth five. Cool, that's consistent. And then all of a sudden it's worth one. So now we're trying to run into problems. And then it's worth four. So it's not consistent, jumping around. You can't have from here to here worth one, whereas here to here, the same sort of space is worth five. So it's got to be consistent. So this scale does not work. Um, so we got to change that. So you ask yourself, well, what scale should I use? Uh, and there's other, one other problem with this. I'll let you pause if you want to think about it for a sec. What's the other problem with the y-axis scale? So not only is it inconsistent, which is not good. You know, if the student wants to go by fives, that's fine, go by fives. But you can't all of a sudden change it to one, and then four, and then back to fives. So it's got to be consistent, and um, it's got to fit all of our data. So and what's the other problem? Well, the other problem is we're not starting at zero. We should start at zero. Um, all right, so well, what scale would you use? Our highest number is 36. Again, we have 10 boxes. Maybe if you had a bigger graph, you can use 20 boxes. And I would, instead of dividing by 10, I would divide by 20. But in this case, I only have 10 boxes, so I'm gonna divide by 10. I get 3.6. Again, I, I'd rather not, like all these are whole numbers. I don't really want to use a decimal if I don't have to. Sometimes you will have to use a decimal, that's fine. So what can I go by? Well, I can go by fours. Can I go by fives? Sure, you can go by fives too. Can you even go by sixes? Yeah, you can go by sixes if you wanted to. It would just have to be consistent. If you go by four, every single box should be worth four. Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, and so on. If you go by fives, that's cool. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Um, if you want to go by sixes, six, 12, 18, 24, 30, and so on. Uh, as long as it's consistent, it's going to fit all data, it works. If it doesn't fit all data, then just pick a, a different scale. You have to pick like a slightly bigger number if um, you run out of room. All right, so we got our scale. You can pick fours or fives. You got to start at zero. And then ask yourself, well, what type of graph am I using again? And how would I plot that data? All right, well, I'll let you pause if you want to think about it. What type of graph would you use? What would it kind of look like? Uh, let's look at one other problem here. All right, so this student chose to go by tens. You can see all the data, if they go by tens, does the data fit? Well, yeah, it only goes to 36, and we got up to 100. So all the data fits, but it's all here crunched from here down. So you got all this extra space of the graph, but half the space, even more than half, is not being used. So our scale is probably too big. They're going by tens, and we should go by something lower. Again, fours or fives or sixes. Everything else, well, there's another problem with this graph, um, but they do have the child's names. Here's 27. They have the data plotted well, which is good. All right, this is 36, just a little bit above halfway point. This one is two, maybe make it a little lower, but it works. This one is 13, this one's 12. Those data points are generally fine. Uh, but the problem, the other problem with this, other than the scale being too big, you know, the data's kind of crunched here. If they're going by tens, it'll fit. It's just all of it, it's kind of crunched from here down. We can pick a better scale. So this kind of works, but we can get a better scale. And then the other problem with this is we're comparing children, how much they eat. 
So if we're comparing, we should probably use a bar graph again. So here we go, is a better graph to accurately show the data and the scale. This student used fours. As long as it's consistent, it all fits. And we can see it's a good representation. We're using most of the space, which is nice. Um, we have a title, we have labels, and we have the data plotted correctly, I believe. And even have a little color scale here. Maybe move this scale to somewhere on the graph so it's easy to use. Um, but otherwise, looks good. And then our last example here. Maybe this one's a little tougher, maybe not, I don't know. All right, so what's the problem here? Let's look at the setup of the data table. Again, we have two pieces of information. We have, uh, so it says, this is a graph of how high a bouncy ball bounced when dropped from different heights. So it gives a little explanation. So we have the height dropped, and here's the units and meters, and the height of the bounce. All right, so what kind of graph would you use if we have the height dropped and the height of the bounce? What kind of graph would you use? What's the independent variable? What affects what? Does the height dropped affect the height of the bounce, or does the height of the bounce affect the height dropped? Or if you rather look at it as what depends on what, does the height drop depend on the height of the bounce, or does the height of the bounce depend on the height dropped? So to me, and hopefully to you, the height dropped affects the height of the bounce, or you can say it height of bounce depends on the height dropped. So that makes this the independent variable and then the height of the bounce, right? That depends on, well, how high did you drop the ball from? And that will affect the bounce. So it looks like, you know, the higher you drop the ball from, the higher it's gonna bounce. And that makes sense. All right, so that means our height drop should be and our x-axis is our independent goes on x-axis but they put look what they did they put the height of the bounce here they didn't label this but this is supposed to be the height dropped or this is what they wrote height dropped but again we should have the independent variable on the x-axis so they kind of flipped them which happens a lot it happens a lot of students do this they kind of flip the, the y-axis and x-axis so actually we have to take these and kind of switch them for each other, swap them out. Um, otherwise, you know, they applied some data and they have a scale, like maybe have some issues with this. Because what they did was they just took all the Y values and made that their scale, but that doesn't work. You can't just take the Y values and make it your scale. We didn't do that in any other one. We didn't. Let me go backwards. We didn't take these numbers and make it our scale because we did. We had 0, 2, 12, 13. The scale would not be consistent. So you can't do that. You make the scale, and the scale just has to be able to fit your data, but the scale should not be the exact data. So if you have 36, we'll just go, it goes somewhere between 30 and 40, and you would just put a dot there. So that's a common mistake is people just make this the scale when it shouldn't be. You have to make the scale based on the information. Um, all right, so here's an example of a student actually doing that with the correct independent variable height dropped on the x-axis, the height of the bounce on the y-axis. We even have the units here, which is nice. It's in meters. We have a title. All right, what's our scale? Well, the height dropped is our x-axis, and it basically goes two, three, four, or five, up to eight. Um, Maybe you make this a zero and then this a one, two. I wouldn't really take off points for this. You don't always have to start the x-axis at zero. So they put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That works for me. They plotted the data. Looks like it's plotted correctly. Um, at two meters, it was 1.3. Oh, how they come up with their scale for the y-axis? Again, they took the data here. They didn't use it, they didn't write like 1.3 and 2.1 and 3.1, because that wouldn't be consistent, right? Because here to here is one meter, but here to here is like 0.8 meters. Here's 0.8 meters, here's 0.7 meters. Anyway, it's not consistent. So you'd have to figure out, well, our data goes from 1.3 to 5.8. You gotta fit that all in there. Well, what are you gonna go by? Well, if you go by halves, 0.5, maybe it'll work, but you might run out of room. 
because if I do 5.8, again, I get 10 boxes. So I'll divide by 10. If I had 20 boxes, if I had like a bigger graph, maybe I'd divide by 20 instead. And I'd have a bigger graph, but in this case, I only have 10 lines. Again, one, two, three, four, five, it's already labeled, seven, 10. Oh, maybe they labeled it wrong, but that's cool. And you would get 0.58. You can use a calculator if you have to. All right, so I wouldn't want to go by 0.58, but could you go by 0.75? Yeah, I guess you can go by 0.75, or you can make your life a little easier and go by ones for this scale. This student went by ones and they stay consistent. We're cool with that. They could have gone by 0.75, so it have been a little harder on the math, but it would have worked. All right, so that's, that looks good. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Again, these are some of the common mistakes. It's figuring out, well, what should our scale be? You look at the y-axis data and you make a consistent scale that will fit everything. Um, and it should be, again, consistent. So that was a problem with some of these other ones. This one's consistent, 10, 20, 30, 40, but our data is kind of crunched here. So our scale is just too big, so we have to go a little smaller. Again, going backwards. Uh, this scale doesn't make sense because we didn't start at zero and it kind of jumps all over the place from this box is worth three, this one was worth four, and so on. So it's not consistent. Hopefully this was helpful in terms of making this. Um, I appreciate it. And you can always just ask me questions. Come on over to office hours. Bye, guys. Bye.